Welcome to this new module. This is today's plan. We'll start with an introduction, then discuss how surveys are processed, how we ask questions, and finally we will finish with some logistics and data collection notes. Surveys are a frequently used tool for collecting experimental data in social science research. They can have a considerable impact on the study conclusions. In an RCT, there are many important surveys, but the most important two are the baseline and the end line. The baseline's two main characteristics are one, that it is conducted before the implementation of an experiment, and two, that it has potential to improve the analysis considerably. The end line, on the other hand, is conducted after the treatment is delivered and is primarily used to measure outcomes. As well, including questions about implementation can improve analysis and interpretation greatly. The following is an EAGP checklist of what the baseline and the endline surveys will allow us to do. Namely, the baseline survey must 1. Describe the population 2. Adjust treatment effect estimates specifically, are the questions asked predictive of the outcomes 3. Help estimate heterogeneous treatment effects 4. Design a blocked randomization procedure and 5. Describe the balance across treatment and control conditions. The endline survey must estimate effects. It can assess if spillover occurred or if there was interference. It can measure non-compliance and look for causal underlying mechanisms that explain how the treatment was transmitted. The baseline and the endline can include many types of questionnaires. The list is comprised, among other components, of an HH household listing or roster, a main survey, the primary informants, for example, chiefs, politicians, teachers, etc., interviewer observations, diaries, for example, time, activities, food, etc., and focus groups, which are qualitative interviews. Here is an example survey. In this example, the survey begins with a household form with general information questions. See that it includes a list of questions or boxes for close format answers. They are organized in modules. Modules are components or subsections of an instruction. For example, a consent form, demographic questions about health, etc. Questions on the same topic should be grouped together into modules. For each module, you can also provide an introductory script to guide the flow of the interview. Similarly, this is a household roster. This is a list of all the household members with questions about demographic characteristics, such as education level, etc. Here is another questionnaire. This time it is for an individual. Now let's talk about standardized questionnaires. These can be quantitative or qualitative. It is important, however, to think about what affects the data and conclusions from a survey. Who answers the questions? Who asks the questions? What questions are asked? And who else is around can directly affect the conclusions. The question is, then, how do we design the questions? There are many different types of questions. Questions can be quantitative or qualitative. They can have different formats, for example, open-ended versus closed, hypothetical, self-administered versus interviewer, amongst others. Where should we start? Here are some important points about surveys. They are structured conversations between strangers. Thus, they are subject to most of the communication problems in ordinary conversations, like inattention, misunderstanding, strategic behavior, and posturing and projection. The answers to questions will be affected by the environment, questions being misinterpreted or processed incorrectly or incompletely or inaccurately, like in a testing situation. Let's then think about the survey response process. 
There are four main stages according to Schwartz, 2007. Comprehension, Retrieval, Judgment, and Response. The comprehension stage involves the process of paying attention to questions and instructions, identifying the specific focus of the questions, and translating concepts and logic. Thus, it is important to use the correct terminology and qualifications in questions. Second, retrieval describes the recalling of generic and specific memories, reconstructing details. To help, you can use questions that help retrieve specific bits, distinctive events, remembered quantities, or total outlays. In judgment, individuals evaluate these reconstructed memories, draw inferences and estimates, and integrate retrieved material. Finally, in the response stage, individuals map the estimate to a response category and edit the response. Thus, it is very important to write questions that avoid misrepresentation, evasiveness, or non-informative or a non-responsive answer. Now, let's discuss how to ask better questions. We will show you some empirical findings about design. Let's start with how we introduce a survey, questionnaire, or module. Suppose you interview Parkinson patients living in the state of Pennsylvania. For some, the survey is introduced as a survey of Pennsylvania residents. For others, as a survey of Parkinson patients. Would that influence A, reported health satisfaction, and B, the relationship between life satisfaction, asked as question one, and self-reported quality of health, excellent to poor? If so, how and why? The survey varied how Parkinson patients living in Pennsylvania were introduced. Either the survey was introduced as a survey of Pennsylvania residents or as a survey of Parkinson patients. In study one, in a scale from zero to 10, respondents reported a health satisfaction of 5.3 when the survey said Pennsylvania residents and 6.1 when the survey said Parkinson patients. The logic behind this gap is that the names provide different frames of reference. In other words, how their health is relative to the population versus how their health is relative to other patients. Some respondents may feel pressure to provide an answer to survey questions that they don't know the answer to. Let's consider, for example, fictitious issues. A study by Gilles asked, do you favor or oppose the Metallic Metal Act? 70% of the respondents reported an opinion, and yet the act does not exist. In subsequent studies, 30% to 50% reported opinions on fictitious or highly obscure issues. Similarly, a different survey asked, have you heard about copolymia? 47% had heard of this. When asked what this was, these were their answers. And yet, copolymia does not exist. Here are some open format versus closed format questions. Suppose respondents were asked, what is the most important thing that children should learn to prepare them for life? The answer, to think for themselves, was given 62% when the team offered a closed format response. In contrast, it was only volunteered 5% when the question had an open format. Which is better? It depends on the survey goal. It is also worth noting that there is a forbid allow asymmetry. Suppose we were to ask, how should the United States respond to public speeches against democracy? A survey randomly asked whether the government should allow it or forbid it. The results showed that 25% said allow it, but 46% said forbid it when the original question mentioned the word forbid. The arrangement of the words in a question also matters. Say you want to know if male or female teachers are more empathetic with regard to academic and personal problems of students. A study asked, thinking of your teachers in high school, would you say that your female teachers were more empathetic 
with regard to your academic and personal problems than your male teachers, or were they less empathetic? Versus a second option, thinking of your teachers in high school, would you say that your male teachers were more empathetic with regard to your academic and personal problems than your female teachers, or were they less empathetic? 41% of the respondents said females were more empathetic when asked about female versus males, while 55% said males were more empathetic when the question asked about males versus females. The enumerator or interwire also has a significant role in the respondent's answers. The enumerator can make decisions on how some answers can be coded. In this example is a lamp, a piece of furniture. A shared decision needs to be made amongst the numerators. There might need to be a protocol to make sure every interviewer codes answers in the same way. There are two main types of interviewer techniques. A standardized interviewer will simply have a script or protocol to follow for conducting the interview. She will say phrases like, let me repeat the question, or would that be a yes or a no, or whatever it means to you. In contrast, a conversational interviewer will conduct the interview with less structure. For example, in this survey, a lamp is not household furniture. Again, the choice depends on the context and the type of intervention policy that is being conducted. A very essential part of survey design is how rating scales are coded. Let's consider the following experiment. British participants were asked to rate Tony Blair on some trait dimensions shortly after his election. They were asked if Tony Blair was caring, friendly, honest, and intelligent on a scale from 0 to 10 versus a different scale from minus 5 to plus 5. Then they were asked, how effective do you believe Tony Blair will be as Prime Minister? The results indicate that respondents thought Tony Blair would be more effective when his traits were rated along the minus 5 to plus 5 scale. Why would this be, do you think? Consider the numeric value of scales using the following case experiment. Respondents were asked, how successful would you say you've been in your life? The two different scales, from 0 to 10 and from minus 5 to plus 5, were used. In both cases, the lower value is not at all successful, and the higher value is very successful. The graph indicates the percentage of respondents below the midpoint in each question. In the 0 to 10 scale, 34% indicated a value between 0 and 5, while in the minus 5 to plus 5 scale, only 11% of the respondents replied with a negative value. Here's an additional example using scales from 0 to 10 or from 1 to 11. Consider the following questions about how much respondents enjoy getting a haircut, visiting a museum, and attending a poetry reading. Consistently, the answers are lower when the scale goes from 1 to 11. Rating scales can lead to ambiguity. Let's look at the following question. Suppose respondents rate a politician's intelligence along a scale with different numeric values using one of two scales. One scale is not so intelligent 0 to very intelligent 10 versus another scale of not so intelligent minus 5 to very intelligent plus 5. How would that affect their ratings? Would it also affect subsequent predictions of this politician's likely success as a prime minister assessed in a format that does not vary the numbers? If so, how? But does not so intelligent refer to the absence of intelligence or the opposite of intelligence entirely? There is an ambiguity here. A scale of 0 to 10 has a unipolar dimension with the presence or absence of intelligence. But a scale of minus 5 to plus 5 has a bipolar dimension with opposite values, resulting in higher ratings due to the more extreme scale anchor on the negative side. This effect is based on differential interpretations of the verbal anchors of the scale. 
Now let's consider how visual cues affect rating scales. In a 1987 International Social Survey Program, ISSP, researchers assessed perceptions of social stratification in nine countries. They asked participants the following question to a representative sample. In our society, there are groups which tend to be towards the top of society and groups which tend to be towards the bottom. Below is a scale that runs from top to bottom. Where would you place yourself on this scale? There was a 10-point rating scale in all nine countries, with the scale going from 1, which equals the top of society, to 10, equaling the bottom of society. In most affluent nations, for example the U.S., Germany, or Switzerland, about 10% of the respondents place themselves at the bottom of the social hierarchy, choosing a value between 8 and 10. To the researcher's surprise, however, 37.1% of the Dutch respondents answered the same, in contrast to what one would expect on the basis of the rather homogeneous social stratification of the affluent Netherlands. Why did this happen? In this survey, different scales were used. The Dutch researchers used a pyramid format, whereas all others used a set of stacked equal-sized boxes in a ladder format. The visual cue in the pyramid format played a significant role in the Dutch respondent's interpretation of the question. A similar consideration can be made about frequency scales. Let's look at the following results of a survey about daily TV consumption. The low frequency scale has smaller jumps in frequency than the high frequency scale. The first segment in the high frequency scale is equivalent to the second highest segment in the low frequency scale. Results show that more than two and a half was reported by 16% of the respondents in the first scale, while in the second scale, more than two and a half was answered by 36% of the respondents. So the span of scales matters. Now let's analyze reference periods. Suppose respondents were asked one of the following questions. A. How often were you angry yesterday? Or B. How often were you angry last month? Or C. How often were you angry last year? Do you think the reference period would influence how they interpret the question and how they answer? If so, how and why? What does the researcher mean by angry? Does it mean a major or a minor irritation? For nearly any experience, minor anger happens more frequently than major anger. Question A presupposes that there was anger, or else it would have been worded as, Were you angry yesterday? Given that instances of major anger happen more rarely than minor anger, they probably had minor anger in mind when they responded. If instances of minor anger is meant, Question C makes no sense, as it would be impossible to recall the number of instances of minor anger for a whole year. Thus, they probably had instances of major anger in mind when they responded. Hence, the responses refer to more extreme experiences the larger the reference period is. Suppose we want to study how often and how seriously respondents experience anger. The researchers were interested in how respondents interpret ambiguous questions. A study asked the following questions. How often do you get angry within a typical week? And how often do you get angry within a typical year? The frequency of anger eliciting situations were measured on a scale from 1, very rare, once a year or less, to 10, very often, daily or more often. Participants also rated the seriousness of the event causing the anger on a scale from 1, not serious or trivial, to 10, very serious, for instance, a major life event. Results indicate that the degree of anger within a week was on average 5.32 on the scale, but 6.37 when asked about yearly instances of anger. However, the frequency was higher for the weekly question than the yearly question. 6.65 versus 
The environment may affect how individuals respond in a survey. These effects are called context effects. Real-world contexts include things such as personal events in a respondent's life, public events in the nation, and the weather, amongst other life-altering events or characteristics. The interviewer or enumerator's characteristics and behavior can also change how the respondent processes and responds to a survey. Where the interview is conducted, for example at home, work, hospital, or the street, can also affect the understanding of a question. The presence of others may also affect the responses. While each of these factors can influence the answer a respondent provides, some of them are more problematic for the overall survey than others. Finally, let's consider the response order. Suppose respondents were asked one of the following questions in a telephone interview. At dinner, what would you prefer to eat? The best main course you have ever had or the best dessert you have ever had? Or, at dinner, what would you prefer to eat? The best dessert you have ever had or the best main course you have ever had? Both alternatives are likely to elicit positive responses. With an auditory format, there is a recency effect, which means that respondents are more likely to pick the last heard option. With a visual format, there is a primacy effect. In other words, respondents are more likely to pick the first option they read. Let's look at a different version of the same issue. Suppose respondents are asked one of the following questions in a telephone interview. Suppose you are traveling in a foreign country and have to choose between two exotic foods you may not like. What would you prefer to eat? Caramelized worms or spicy fish eyes, one, or two, spicy fish eyes or caramelized worms. Both alternatives are likely to elicit negative responses. Now, let's analyze survey logistics. Here are some important notes to consider. Even when designing a new instrument, there are a lot of resources out there. Many researchers are willing to share questionnaires from past projects, and many agencies have important questionnaires online. If you are designing an N-line survey, survey, use the previous round's questionnaire as your starting point. To facilitate comparability across survey rounds, only modify questions when necessary. Use standard measures to make out-of-sample comparisons when possible. In general, it is better to remove or add questions than to change them. Be careful with module ordering and instrument length. With the order of the modules, avoid placing complicated questions too early or too late in the survey. Remember that responding to a survey is wearing for the respondent, so keep it as short as possible. The understanding of a questionnaire decreases the longer the survey is. Be careful with sensitive questions. What determines whether a question is sensitive depends on many things such as the environment or culture. In general, however, information that is sensitive may mean that respondents may not answer truthfully due to social desirability bias, strategic behavior, or embarrassment. There are strategies to deal with sensitive questions, such as involving protocols in deciding what to ask, who should ask the questions, and to whom they should ask them. Informed consent through surveys, photos, videos, or audio recordings is a vital part of data collection. The informed consent form should include all relevant information about the study, personnel and contact info, study purpose, organization, efforts you will take to ensure privacy, anonymity, etc. Finally, let's talk about pilot surveys. By the time you implement your survey in the field, you need to feel confident that respondents will understand the questions, that respondents will be comfortable responding to questions, that the questions are not leading, that the questions produce enough variation in the data, and that you have included all the relevant response categories and that you won't get a lot of non-responses, and that the instrument is not too long. To test this, pilot surveys are done. To end our class, let's talk about data collection. 
Managing a survey is a massive logistical undertaking. Survey programming is currently conducted digitally. There are three stages, planning, programming, and testing. However, programming a survey is often an iterative process. Survey platform tools are used to help enumerators administer the survey. Some examples include ODK, Survey CTO, etc. Standardized variable names and values are used, both within and across surveys, to reduce the time spent cleaning data. Time is planned to test the form so that you can identify and correct programming errors before the survey launches. It is always smart to plan for emergencies and always have a paper backup plan. Here are some additional relevant notes regarding data collection. One, be careful with the timing of relevant events. For example, a study on education may need surveys at the start and or at the end of the academic year. Two, always communicate with local authorities. You may need to get permission to survey from district officials. Plan for this as early as possible, as in some areas you will not be able to begin survey activities before obtaining permission. Not communicating survey plans with local authorities might be problematic. Three, make sure your respondents, enumerators, and field workers stay safe. If you are working in an area where extreme weather or conflict is happening, the necessary precautions must be taken. Four, Limit seasonal factors or dosage changes that come with time. For example, a treatment may have very different effects if implemented directly after harvest versus during the lean season. 5. The time of day or day of the week when interviews need to be conducted changes according to the respondents. How do we interview employed people with set hours of work or those with limited availability? 6. Regardless of timing, build in contingency days and budget for additional costs always. Here are some final thoughts. Reliable data is a critical tool in policy design. The baseline and endline surveys are key components. Designing a good survey is an essential part of RCT interventions. However, there are important challenges associated with design. There are many questionnaire and question types, cognitive bias, and practical concerns. Again, pilot surveys are essential. Finally, do not underestimate the role of data collection.